with this latest banking crisis is, you know, a flight to safety away from these kind of trust-based money uh, like bank deposits to hard money like, you know, Bitcoin. Okay, so today we've got Justin Bannon back on the podcast. Welcome, Justin. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jamie. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Justin Bannon is the co-founder and CEO of Boson Protocol. And Boson Protocol actually went through our first formal accelerator program all the way back in 2008. And 19. He's been on the podcast before. If you want to hear about his origin stories, uh, just search for him. We're not going to cover too much of that now. I'm going to assume you know who Justin is. Um, As I said, um, there's plenty of information we've got on on previous podcast episodes. Really, we're going to get an update on what's going on in the world of Boson Protocol. Boson Protocol enables the tokenization, transfer, and trade of physical things as redeemable NFTs. And the thing that got us excited all those years ago, and keeps us excited is Boson Protocol has a primitive or a set of primitives for decentralized commerce, de-commerce. So it's very timely to get Justin on. A, they've got some really interesting network upgrades and updates, but also Amazon uh, recently announced that they're going to be doing some things with NFTs. And so um, given Boson Protocol is in many ways the antidote to Amazon, um, and other more kind of centralized platform marketplaces. It's interesting to get Justin's perspective on Amazon, his perspective on where we are more generally in the context of, of Web3. So let's get into it. Maybe if you could kind of just give us a, an espresso shot description of, of what Boson Protocol is now today as a stack for those those people that aren't familiar with you. Where we are today with Boson Protocol is we've released a full production grade version of of the protocol V2 last November. And this enables the tokenization of, of physical assets into the redeemable NFTs that can then be sort of traded like any other NFT. And critically, what Boson enables is this bridge between Web3 and, and, the, and the, the physical world, such that if you hold one of these NFTs, you have like a strong, incredible claim on the underlying asset that either you'll get that asset or your money back. And that is independent of issuers and sellers and, and all of those kind of like trust-based systems that, that you see in Web2. It's, it's a provable asset. So that, that protocol is live. Our sort of primary focus right now is, uh, is bu- building bridges and extensions Um, into sort of mainstream and web two to drive adoption. Great. Thanks for that. And maybe just like one extra additional piece of information. And that's without the requirement for kind of hardware integrations and chips placed in physical goods. And I know that's been a lot of focus about how you create digital twins or fidgetals. It it does this all through software, right? All through these kind of... Absolutely. It does this all through codes. I mean, essentially what Boson uses is it's a type of future contract where buyer and seller make uh, you know stake financial commitments against completing kind of commerce transaction at some point in the future and with with sort of any deviations from the happy path i disputes handled first by game theory and then being escalated to sort of independent dispute resolvers that can be fully decentralized or less centralized and not less decentralized, but more efficient. And the vision for this is beyond kind of one single protocol. Ultimately, it's everything from, you know, the, the transaction itself all the way through to redemption. And in theory, uh, could handle even, you know, the kind of fulfillment and logistics part. You create an entirely decentralized commerce stack. Obviously, we're not there yet. But that's kind of the big vision. And I know you're very collaborative as well. So it's not necessarily that you're looking to build all of this, right? It's bringing the composability that we see in DeFi to the world of e-commerce. So super exciting stuff only gets more relevant. And actually, when you're talking about these as financial primitives, as futures, I know you have some interesting insights to kind of 
contextualize this in in this kind of breakdown of trust that we're seeing in in in, in wider markets, right? The, the trust that somebody has the assets or the collateral that they say that they have. How, how can we be sure even the, the current regulatory environment can't guarantee that for us? Bank runs, etc. So we're going to get into all, all of that stuff in a little bit. But let's let's start in the context of e-commerce or de-commerce, decentralized commerce. Let's talk about some of the the recent upgrades and announcements that you've got coming. With uh, Metaverse Fashion Week in Decentraland approaching, we are about to launch our Decentraland widget, which um, essentially enables any um, builder uh, within Decentraland or or landowner to very simply enable decentralized commerce by dropping like like a kiosk into Decentraland, which they can then load with a physical item and use boson to sort of tokenize this physical item and have it have it sold directly within the scene in a full, in a fully decentralized way. So I think the question is, you know, why decentralized? I think there's a lot of excitement around the open metaverse and these more open environments. That's kind of fallen away with the wider market for NFTs and, and the premium for NFTs. And then now there's a lot of skepticism about these the, these kind of open open metaverse. Worlds. Why? Why did you choose Decentraland, and how important is that uh, in isolation to to your strategy? The, the Decentraland widget is the the first of um, you know a whole host of widgets. Our strategy is is to basically enable enable you to sell anywhere across you know metaverses, gaming, uh, you know plugins to websites, um, doing open sea drops literally literally everywhere but yeah we you know we, we've started with decentraland on uh, you know our, our very first version of boson protocol we had a decentraland widget and it seemed that you know it's, it's it's a good good place to start there's a whole sort of metaverse fashion week happening uh later this month plus you know the the nature of of, of, of decentraland in terms of it enabling smart contract interactions etc and us having you know a number of relationships with the big metaverse Builders just meant it's a natural place to start, but it's very much a starting point from a for a very kind of comprehensive uh, kind of plug-in strategy. A lot of people, you know, building highly innovative things. Uh, see, it's a sandbox as well, right? It's a sandbox where you have early adopters who are looking to play around with innovations. So whilst it might not have the kind of volume of usage of a fortnight, um, it is an environment where you can you can really innovate, uh, prove a use case. Um, and then hopefully kind of roll that out. So you, you hinted at a couple of things there. You hinted at um, gaming. So presumably we, we can expect some uh, gaming engine integrations. You hinted at website widgets, almost like a Shopify type experience. Um, is, is, is that a good way to think of it? You can think of Boson Protocol as like this base layer infrastructure. You can think of it as like TCP IP for commerce. So it's a it's a layer, a settlement layer that enables commerce and 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 sits in the middle between the buyer and the seller, performing the same sort of role as like an Amazon, but obviously just with code. Um, but what the the and so the first part of of uh, you know our kind of strategy is building that that settlement layer. Now we're looking to plug that into in everywhere. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We're starting with Decentraland and and you know extending to other metaverses. But of of course, gaming is a massive massive use case, and you you know you you can expect plugins there to um, you know the major gaming engines um, because you know you know imagine if you know you're you're in a game. I don't know Grand Theft Auto or something. You know you could you know okay, it might be quite nice to go and buy a pair of sneaker like you know digital wearable NFT skin. You know skins within that game or something um with boson you can actually buy a physical item as an as a redeemable nft and we just handle that trust layer and redemption all the way back to the to, to, to the seller and that seller doesn't even need to be like a super trusted entity like a major brand it can be sold by anyone you don't even need to know that because you can trust that either you'll get the item or your money back no matter which virtual world you're in and i think it's that spectrum that's really interesting right so you, you have done work with major brands. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. As I understand it, it's, a, it's about 50 brands so far, and you, you sold uh, several thousand physical items and digital items. But then it, it can also work, as you say, for that long tail of creator, but then also presumably just pure peer-to-peer transaction, right? So two players in a game, 
want to carry out a transaction for a physical good. Could you just talk about both, maybe those three points? So you've, you've got your your big brands, you talk about some of the work you've done there, some of the numbers, you've got SMEs, you know, small independent retailers, all the way to, you know, kind of peer-to-peer transactions between individuals. With with big brands, I mean, la- at last year's Metaverse Fashion Week, we had brands like Tommy Hilfiger and, and, and Hogan, and yeah, we sold several fa- thousand sort of physical items and about sort of $8 million worth of, of, of transactions. And, and most of that was on, on sort of version one of, of, of the protocol. And we, we, you know, we continue to sort of work with and, and support some of these brands. But also more, more importantly, as an infrastructure play, where now version two is plugging into, we sign partnerships with all like the major metaverse builders, with a number of sort of big sort of advertising agencies and sort of web three agencies. So that we're more the infrastructure that enables these the, these these sort of integrators, if you like, to, to build for these brands. Um, and then yeah, again in the in, in the middle, um, the less well known le- less well known brands can pick up Boson and you know plug in and 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 sell physical items as NFTs, um, and then all the way to peer to peer transactions. I mean, you could, you know, you you could be wandering around in the metaverse or playing a game, and you could meet someone who claims to have some kind of you know physical item that you were collecting, and were you know, and you could use Boson to do a transaction. Um, in the same sort of way that you might use an eBay, for example, um, and Boson basically ensures that, that that there's a fair that there's fair exchange, um, and so and it can and and it can do all of that whilst re, you know retaining the anonymity of of sort of you know buyers and sellers. It's 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 you know can 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 uh, enable this sort of peer to peer physical transaction in the way that you might expect to be able to do with like a just a, a pure digital asset. So I know you're thinking about redeemable NFTs as a form of hard property right. Can you talk about that and why it's important now and in, in this kind of current macro environment? Well, I think what we're seeing now with this latest banking crisis is, you know, a flight to safety away from these kind of trust-based money uh, like bank deposits to hard money like you know bitcoin and and likewise we I think we're going to see this whole transition in the economy away from you know trust based assets that rely on platforms and intermediaries to to honor them to what we call hard property rights and with boson redeemable nfts you have the same strong credible guarantees that if you hold this nft either you'll get the item on your money back or your money back and I think across the whole economy, we are going to be moving to a, to, a, to a harder economy. So let's maybe zoom out. Off air, we were talking about Boson in the context of everything that's going on in the wider macro environment, whether that's FTX, uh, you know, last year, don't want to dwell on that too much, but bank runs that are happening or are expected to happen over the course of what, where we're now in, in 23. Can you, can you talk about the importance of things like Boson in, in that context? I've tweeted a bit about this and a and, and number of interviews sort of coming out as, as, as well. But, you know, what we're in 2008 with the sort of banking crisis, really what we saw was the exposure of the nature of, 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 the, of, of what I would kind of call trust-based assets. So when you, you know, even like when you deposit money into a bank, you receive a deposit receipt that is a trust based asset you are trusting that that bank is going to be around if it's not that you know someone's going to step in and insure your um you know uh deposits etc and it's it's all kind of based on trust likewise you know if you take the, the you know the, the, the you know the the example of doing a commercial exchange using an amazon etc again you you're, you're kind of trusting trusting entities and trusting intermediaries um but what we're seeing once again is that this, you know, this trust can fail, um, and and there's the potential for it failing in a catastrophic way. You know, right right now, if 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 you would you would you know believe some sort of influences um, in particular, um, and so I think you know this time the difference is that there are in crypto now we do have safe a, a safe haven, 
And, and all the times this happened before, it's been hugely concerning, but there's not really been an alternative. And I think this is why so many people are predicting this flight to safety now, because, you know, A, you've got the means and the motivation. We've always had the motivation, but not the means. And in crypto, we have that. And so you'll see, you know, people depositing instead of in a bank into, into like bit, Bitcoin and crypto assets. But there's a huge parallel also with Boson in that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fi- issuing of NFTs in lieu of a physical item, right? But the whole point of an NFT is not the file format. I mean, the whole point of an NFT is it gives you these strong property rights over the actual, you know, kind of digital file, not um, not that it's an NFT file format. And so it's, you know, largely pointless to issue an NFT for a physical without those Web3 claims. I mean, as you know, I used to head up, you know, the Property Pass Group, which issued about a billion dollars per year of digital vouchers for things, right? Airport lounge visits, meals, duty, all of this stuff. I could have changed the file format to NFT and said, ah, look at me, look at this massive innovation. I'm now doing NFT vouchers. It means nothing, right? The point is, if you have, if you're the bearer of one of these assets, be it Bitcoin, you know, or cryptocurrency or a a redeemable NFT, you need to have like a provable, strong and credible claim on the underlying asset that 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 is not subject to the whims of intermediaries or and is immutable basically. And I think we're going to see we're we're, we're going to see a move in the whole economy from trust based to provable assets. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting. It's not just the whims of a platform; it's the solvency of a platform, right? You know, I think we can expect the solvency of any platform, be it a bank or an e-commerce platform or, te- you know, whatever it is to come into question. And I really like what you said there. I think this idea of, you know, we, we talk about hard money in the context of a safe harbor for, for, for wealth and capital and Bitcoin. But actually what I think redeemable NFTs allow for is hard property rights. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think that's, that's really interesting because, there's, I mean, there's always this general noise around, well, how do we bring real world assets to DeFi? And I think that's really picked up over the course of, uh, uh, well, end of 22, beginning of 23. But still, nobody's really solved for it yet because, you know, often there's this question around securitization. But actually, I guess if you think about a redeemable NFT, it doesn't fall into the security category, but can allow for it can allow for a degree of collateralization, right? Because it's a promise. But that thing is that promise has value. It has future value. Um, and the thing doesn't have to be redeemed today, right? It could it could maybe never even be redeemed. It could just be sat in a free port somewhere. And therefore, you know, these redeemable NFTs that have these hard property rights could become the basis for how you onboard all kinds of real world value onto you know these these financial systems we've built i mean there's a sort of second point to this if you have provable assets right so if these assets are you can just take for granted that 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 they will redeem it it you know it, it then opens up this second part about using web3 which is unlike you know the sort of legacy kind of digital economy it's it's programmable, right? I mean, the current digital or the legacy digital economy, I can send, you know, I I can send value and transact value and go and pay with a credit card or whatever, but it's pretty dumb, it's linear. But with the Web3 substrate, it's programmable, right? It's smart. So you've got provable assets and, and programmable assets and you put those two together and it enables you to kind of have a, you know, we recently did a research piece with, Professor Jason Potts, the kind of blockchain um, economist, talking about that we're seeing the emergence of like a computable economy, right? We moved from analog to a dumb, a dumb digital economy to now when you've got provable assets that can be programmed, this thing becomes computable. And he talks about a Turing complete economy, right? So, and the first iteration of it is like, okay, we can now encode the types of th- you know things that were previously loyalty programs instead of having a loyalty engine payments and then some sort of you know kind of uh, 
Amazon or someone to, to kind of deliver, all of that can be encoded within, for example, Boson, right? You can, you can ensure payment, transfer of goods, and all of these rules. You've got provable assets and programmability. And then Boson can compose with DeFi, with all of the... So you end up, you're, you're piecing together like a circuit board economy, right? Between all these protocols, everything's provable and programmable. It ends up being a kind of computable economy, which is a totally different type of economic order and we've you know we've seen that previously in the in the world economy you know like industrial revolution with the rise of kind of capital markets then this sort of digital economy and this and and you know his thesis is this next this next iteration of the economy is a kind of computable slash Turing complete one. Yeah, and trustful, right? You know, people talk about trust less, but I think it, tr- trustful is just a system that you can you can trust. So you you talked about you got the Met- Metaverse Fashion Week coming up. So we are what date are we today? We're the twenty third of March when we're recording this. This will probably go out um, some point next week. So I think. Uh, roughly when the Metaverse Fashion Week's about to happen. You've got some interesting things happening there. Could you talk through the various different activities? We are going to be hosting an event with with a number of um, sort of uh, attendees. So we've got uh, partners such as WooCommerce, Polygon, and Decentraland. I, I'll be doing a, a panel there on commerce in, in the Metaverse and, and, and talking through you know how, how we see the future there. Um, also doing a whole product launch and unveiling of the of the of the new wi- widget um, to a whole you know whole audience of builders etc. Um, and then having a, a more future looking um, panel as well um, with um, you know some of our partners such as DressX, Metaverse Group, and um, and uh, Animoca, and, and really talking about the, the kind of future of of, of digital fashion. Um, so, so yeah, a, a, a busy week next week. Good stuff. Well, uh, hopefully people catch us in time, uh, to be able to make it over there. Definitely recommend it. You know, I think, you know, Justin has continued to be ahead of the pack and, uh, not only that, but managed to, uh, survive, you know, what is now two bear markets and continue to ship product uh, and build traction. So, you know, timing is everything, um, but also so is so is to have that kind of fortitude of of, of surviving and, and and keeping focus, keeping teams focused. So, uh, congratulations uh, on the latest release, Justin. Great to have you on. Um, and I guess we'll probably catch up maybe towards the end of the year to see where you're at. Brilliant. Thanks, Jamie, and and thanks again to everyone at Outlier.